You're listening to Partners United on Resource Governance, brought to you by Shehu Musa Yaradua Foundation. Hello, listeners. Welcome to another episode of the Partners United podcast on Resource Governance. Today's episode is Sector and Climate Resilience. And I will be speaking with Professor Sofri Joab Peterside, an activist, scholar, sociologist, and political historian. He is of the Department of Sociology, University of Port Harcourt, and also oversees the phenomenal Center for Advanced Social Sciences. Welcome to the podcast, Professor Peterside. Uh, thank you, Congress. And thank you, every other person there. Thank you for joining us. Um, let's begin the conversation. Even though companies are said to be generally strengthening their own climate change resilience, the private sector sees it that government should shoulder the bulk of the work, the burden of climate action. Now, what can be done to ensure that the private sector goes beyond making pledges and statements and publishing sustainability reports and climate targets to take real action to help mitigate the impacts of climate change? I agree that the climate is a, a global thing, but oftentimes it is when human beings actually begin to you know, take actions uh, that creates the problem. And most of those actions that are taken are taken uh, by organizations, uh, some of them not government, even though sometimes government agencies are involved. And so if by their own businesses and man's own quests, uh, for survival, the environment has been affected, then it just means that um, the private sector also need to take you know, uh, some responsibilities in uh, making sure uh, that uh, the humans can actually adapt you know, to that environment, uh, to this environment. I think that that is what ought to happen. But oftentimes in our own country, uh, everything is left for government. And these business concerns, you know, actually don't play the role they ought to play. That, again, is a consequence of the nature of the state in Nigeria, uh, because uh, it is a captured state, both international uh, and local organizations and uh, agencies have captured the state, and particularly uh, state officials. And so what private sectors ought to do, we find out they shrink in that responsibility because government officers and officials don't insist that those things happen. So I think that um, the private sector uh, have a role to play in this uh, uh, whole problem that we see. Because uh, the climate change itself is set to, it's already become one of the significant, if not the most significant challenges uh, for economies and for society within uh, the last decade, and for some decades to come, it will continue to be. And so that creates the problem of uh, how uh, we need to adapt to its impact and what will be crucial in this process, particularly for human well-being. The private sector should also get involved, particularly raising awareness of its imperative in this adaptation is very important. So I think against the backdrop, the private sector, there's that need for them to mobilize you know, private sources of financing and using their own efficient market mechanism you know, in this regard. So I think that um, uh, the private sector uh, should you know, play a, a very important role in, the, in this respect. And uh, if we need to look at that, the risk are already there. The risk are already there. In fact, the Urban Resilience Conference actually have brought, which took place uh, in September uh, last year, actually brought to limelight and a laid emphasis on the consequences that non-climate risk, in fact, are key concerns for executives who worry most about pressure on the urban infrastructure, overcrowding, and all that. And that, of course, for the private sector, it is going to also increase its competitiveness and improve employee health. And of course, that greater productivity and lowering absenteeism. These are some of the issues that um, should actually drive private sector's involvement in this whole matter. But of course, that work done have also shown that uh, companies 
have a role to play in this regard, in adapting to this change, in financing the adaptation of others, and of course, and supporting others through their own products and services, and of course, through Zealand. So I think, let me explain this a little. When I say adaptation, uh, and I say adaptation is complex and uh, very expensive, uh, what I mean here is that uh, there's that need for the private sector uh, to join in raising awareness. It is very, very important because it's only the beginning of what we need to do for action, that adaptation, creating that awareness. And this will require trillions. It may require trillions. And they cannot come from public sources alone. So that's why I think that mobilizing the private sector sources of financing and using a finish efficient mechanism which the private sectors are familiar with will be key. Because by adapting its own operation access to climate change, the private sector can also ensure business continuity. They can ensure business continuity and protect those uh, who actually depend on private jobs or infrastructure. Now, it is pertinent to note that uh, different types of private sectors or entities can, and in fact, uh, should have different stakes. They have different stakes, actually, in implementing financing and also supporting adaptation. For instance, you have small scale and local companies, you have entrepreneurs, you have farmers. All of them should focus first and foremost on their own adaptation. Because these small scale businesses, local companies and organizations, entrepreneurs, farmers, should first focus on their own adaptation because it's a complex process but they need to start doing that, uh, the small companies. Then the larger organizations uh, should have great potentials, actually, uh, should have great potentials uh, for playing all three roles, which I have discussed, uh, adaptation, funding, and supporting others. So these organizations can play you know, uh, these kind of roles. Then, uh, of course, and uh, if they're doing that uh, from protecting their own immediate access to financially and otherwise supporting a wide range of stakeholders in their own supply chains. So I think that that is key. Then for private associations, uh, there should be cooperative and multiplier work above all, supporting the thriving of their own uh, members and stakeholders, these private associations. So I think that um, they require uh, those kind of uh, support uh, at the moment. And uh, it is important that uh, we lay emphasis uh, on, on those. But of course, it, it, some of these uh, problems also uh, require people's own, uh, citizens' own support also it requires citizens' own support. Thank you so much for throwing up so many important points. Coming back to corporate companies, private sector, and what they're doing in, in terms of climate resilience. Now, you also said that climate risk increases pressure on urban infrastructure and could even affect and does affect the health of workers. So the private sector has real deep interest and should have deep concerns about ensuring that the our environment is generally resilient and there's enough investment in adaptation. And you also said that this will require trillions and cannot come from public sector alone. But now I want to, you to reflect on this. Some people believe that due to the heavy profit motive in the operations of the private sector, they have invested billions in climate denial, especially in the global north. And this has slowed down both the climate negotiations and climate action by countries across the world. Now, what would need to happen to bring a shift from having the private sector not being, uh, not delaying climate action, to actually being leaders or climate champions? No, but it, it, honestly, yeah, comrade, my take, I stand to be contradicted, is that uh, the, the seeming attitude, unpalatable attitude of the private sectors, uh, in most cases uh, derived from the nature of the state 
a, a, in our own kind of country uh, because um, the Nigerian state appears to be a captured state uh, by the political elites uh, whose primary concern is just to exploit uh, whatever situation they find themselves. And so that makes it very, very difficult for some of them who sometimes are either critical stakeholders or shareholders in some of these organizations or who depend on their own position in order to accumulate uh, wealth at the expense of our people. So I, I think it, it has a governance uh, component and there's a governance challenge here because if government can wake up to their responsibility because um, uh, Jeremy Benton has said, and I, I agree with him a long time ago, that the preoccupation of those who occupy political positions should be how to bring happiness to the greatest number of the people. So, and until, you know, in third world countries, until in Africa, uh, those who occupy this position realizes that those positions need to be deployed to bring happiness uh, to the greatest number of the people. Uh, that is the only extent, and to that extent, they can put pressure on uh, on corporate organizations who operate in their domain uh, to obey rules and regulations and also play active role in uh, in uh, revitalizing uh, sustaining a good environment for the operations so i think that um, in certain respects uh, it's also a governance issue uh, and that's what i think sir all right. So um, you're talking about capture states and governance challenge and the need for governments to wake up to their responsibility to ensure that they bring happiness to the greatest number of people. I'm sure our listeners will really say, yes, this is what we need. We, have to, we need government to attend to our needs, to focus on our challenges and bring about solutions. But now my question is, uh, what is the place of partnership between government, the private sector, and civil society in building climate resilience and bring about a change, kind of change that we need? No, no, no. Uh, and you see, uh, comrade, in our country, uh, the civil society are, are, are doing their best, are doing their best. And remember that the civil society also depend in certain respect on international agencies uh, for, for funding. And uh, the, 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 the civil society have also you know, benefited from that national space based on the kind of work they have done, people like you and others, uh, have done in, in their respective countries in Africa. And, and, and so they get uh, that kind of support. And so, and even in our country, if not for the activities of civil society who have become the watchdog of the ordinary citizens, uh, things would have been so bad than you know uh, we can imagine. So it is the activities of the civil society. And I also think that the civil society, that's why I think uh, that we should also play a role as civil society to people in making sure, uh, even though people say that the nature of the state will make it difficult, that those who occupy you know, political positions are those who actually understand. Because that is what it is. Uh, unless, because some of them see uh, just on their face the other way, and things, the environment, and every other thing gets degraded. What they are preoccupied is actually uh, what they will get. Because uh, in our country, Nigeria, for instance, uh, government is a business, actually. And that business is business of the political elite and their, and their, and their lackeys. So I think that um, uh, we require. Uh, to take interest in certain respect in what is happening and who occupies what position uh, in government. I'm waiting to see the manifesto of uh, the key political parties. Uh, I'm waiting to see their manifesto. To now see, and all of us in this country will see, uh, what interest they have taken uh, in the environment, what interest they have taken in the environment, because uh, that is not actually in the public discourse at the moment. So because we need to know what the agenda is uh, for our environment. So I think that, um, and uh, we have laws, we have laws, which you also have played key role uh, in making sure that those laws uh, are domesticated. But it is that willpower, that willpower to actually, you know, implement 
the laws that is issued. And that is where it's a problem. That's where it's a problem. Uh, some people don't bother. They can sell the country. Uh, well, I don't quarrel with some of them because a Swiss writer once wrote that a democracy is a, is, a, is a word that grumbles meaninglessly in an empty stomach. So that's why in our own lifetime, you can see you have what is called a stomach infrastructure uh, in our lexicon. So that has become uh, part of our lexicon. So I think that it is those who are in government, governance should be about the people and the environment is about the people. And so if you don't, then it creates, it creates challenges. And it is even worse in our country now. In every part of our country, you have in the northeast, you have in the northwest, you have in the southeast, insistent crisis between headers and farmers. And these guys are perpetually on the move because of environmental uh, factors to areas where they can get you know, these pastures uh, for, their, for, for their animals. And so we have been seeing that kind of crisis is happening everywhere. Then in the Niger Delta region, oh, that one now, the, 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 we, it's also the problem of governance. Where you see artisanal refining, you know, everywhere. Uh, you wash a cloth and keep outside. I was uh, head of the faculty of social science uh, research team on the NSUIT. And uh, a university-wide thing that I presented the faculty in that team to now see the kind of uh, challenges that we we, we have in our area. So I think uh, uh, these are issues that require urgent uh, attention. And so citizens need to take responsibility. They need to take responsibility in what is happening and take interest in those who occupy this position. Otherwise, the Nigerian state is a capital state and to the benefits of the governing political elites, comrade. Okay, um, now that is... Uh, very clearly put, and it also raises new alarms, uh, because really, when we look at the political events going on around us, uh, we are seeing people looking at government, governance, and politics as transactional relationships, uh, you know, selling their consciences and acting without any serious conviction. So I agree with you that we should all uh, demand that the political parties should present their manifestos to the public so that we know their positions on climate change, know their positions on ecological issues, and see exactly what they would do to restore the state of our environment and, and stop the degradation that we're seeing. So uh, what I learned from what you just said now is that there's a big gap between the people and those in governance structures. And that, that, that kind of, there's a, there's a mistrust between the people and politicians and leaders. Now, and there's also a mistrust, especially in Niger Delta, between the people and the corporations who are polluting the environment. What do you think is the way forward? How can these gaps be bridged? Is the burden on the victims, or is it should it be equally shared uh, by those in, in political power and those who are leading the private sector? Well, honestly, comrade, you, you just hit the nail on the head. It's a collaborative effort. It is a collaborative effort. Because those in government, you know, have key role to play. Even those in the private sectors who are the, are the commanding heights of the organizations uh, also have a, a role to play. Then the citizens also uh, should be the watchdog, making sure that uh, those in power, you know, deploy that power to bring happiness to the people and also making sure uh, that uh, corporate organizations also act in, in tandem with international standards and not to have different standards. Uh, there's an international standard. There's a, a domesticated kind of standard uh, that do not pay very serious attention uh, to global practices when you in the countries where they operate outside their own home countries. And so, so that's why it requires you know, a, 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 a coordinated front a coordinated from a three-point approach, uh, both the international organizations, both the government, and of course, the citizens who are most affected, you know, by the activities 
of uh, that degrade the environment and uh, makes it very, very uninhabitable uh, for those who will emerge in the future. And I think that that is what is required. That kind of three-pronged approach, uh, synergy uh, between government, that is political power here, and international corporate organizations, and of course, the citizens. We must, the citizens must be vigilant because all it requires uh, for those who are in this position, occupying commanding heights in these organizations uh, to do things and do it properly, uh, it requires a vigilant citizenry that hold people accountable, whatever position they occupy, hold them accountable uh, for the actions they have taken uh, and in actions, they, 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 in the, in the, and of course, their inactions in making sure that the environment you know, is sustained uh, so that the future of the future generations are not compromised by the activities of those who are operating at the moment. Uh, that's my thing, comrade. Uh, the conversation has been very rich thus far, and unfortunately, time is always a constraint. Uh, we would like you to tell us about the role that the private sector can play in mobilizing funding for renewable energy projects in Nigeria. I know you, you alluded to this earlier on, but let's just conclude by having you talk a bit more about that. And then secondly, considering the role of the multinational corporations in the devastation of the Nigerian environment, especially the Niger Delta, uh, would it be right to say that we have an outsized expectation from this sector? Honestly, comrades, we can't discuss uh, the situation in our country environmental issues without um, private sector, particularly the multinational corporations in our country, uh, because um, they have uh, created these problems. And of course, they also have the capacity uh, to actually address this problem. And so that's why I think that um, they should uh, actually lead in this uh, fight to make sure that uh, our environment you know, it's, it's not completely uh, degraded. We already have challenges at the moment, but because of the activities, and if not for the international community, um, uh, it, it would have been worse. Because uh, what I see here, uh, since the state has been captured, so there is private in their own country where they operate, you know, they maintain standards. But here, since our people are prepared to sell their own persons, it doesn't matter whether everybody dies, they end up like that. So I think that, uh, like what Mando Fodo wrote a very long time ago, he said, conscience is an open wound. Only truth can heal it. And I think that if they have conscience, uh, these uh, operators, then they will know that uh, what they're doing is not correct. We as citizens must insist they apply the same standards that applied in their home countries, in our own country. And of course, for our elites, the, the, the particular elites, they, they do not take these issues very, very serious. Because if they take it very serious, there are a series of reports, which you comrade, you know, some of them you led in our country, the UNDP report and all those reports, they are just there in the cupboards. Nothing is done or has been done fundamentally all the kind of things we see in intervention are very cosmetics. When somebody comes into office, the first one year, two years, after that, you don't even hear about the environment. Uh, you begin to hear about stomach infrastructure, uh, constructing uh, flyover everywhere, not even minding the consequences, the drainage system and all that. So if there is flood, those wonderful houses you know, become oceans themselves. So I think that that is what is very, very important. Now, the private sector uh, can lead in this process. They can lead because if they do business here, then they have also responsibility to make sure that uh, they also do things properly. Uh, some of them will tell you that they are making fundamental contributions, at least I know in the educational sector, uh, the tax forms and all that, but they should also take part in uh, addressing very fundamentally uh, this uh, adaptation of the environment uh, to the emerging you know, environmental challenges 
it requires funding, like I stated earlier. It requires funding, and that funding is huge. That funding is huge. I'm not saying that they should just take 100% responsibility, but I think that um, they should also take some responsibilities and make sure also that since they're operating, some of them join partnership with government, that at their discussions, they should also want to know, they should know what government is also doing. If they are doing something because it requires, you know, a combined approach, it shouldn't just be government alone. It shouldn't also be the private sector alone, but there must be some element of synergy and regular discussions and conversations and assessment of milestones achieved by both the government and the private sector. But I think the private sector should take the lead because, um, and the management of whatever form that is available uh, shouldn't be left at the whims and caprices of government alone. Because for them, uh, uh, experience has shown that uh, they will just swallow uh, the money. Sorry for using that word, because they will. Uh, so that's why the partnership, there should be a partnership and proper channel of funding and management of the fund. I, I think that would be my own uh, my own take uh, on that. And uh, and of course, you know that uh, banks can also uh, fund uh, through banks and investors uh, should fund both private and public uh, adaptation. Uh, they should uh, fund that. Uh, that's my take uh, on this issue. Thank you so much. It's been a very intense conversation. And I, I would just like to remind our listeners of, on what you said when you quoted Dan Fodio, conscience is an open wound. Only truth can heal it. I mean, we're all living witnesses to the fact that climate uh, change does not discriminate about who it hits. And so everybody has a role to play. I will be speaking on issues around the private sector and climate resilience. Everyone has a role to play, as I said. It's in the best interest of businesses and the private sector to build in climate resilience into their business strategies. It's in the best interest of political leaders to ensure that there's climate resilience in the nation. Otherwise, how would the people survive the onslaught that is still coming? We've been very privileged to have this conversation with Professor Sofri Petersai, who is an activist, scholar, sociologist, and political historian. I want to thank you for being a part of this podcast. Please do join us on the next episode of the Partners United podcast on resource governance. Thank you, Comrade. Thank you, Comrade. This has been wonderful. Thanks a lot for being with us. Bye-bye. Please visit partnersunited.org to join the conversation on environmental justice. To report any issues that have threatened your environment, please visit www.reports.nhrc.gov.ng or blow the whistle at www.reports.corruption.org. You can also visit homef.org for useful advocacy resources on climate change, food systems, freshwater ecosystem, and other socio-ecological issues. 